Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume and we're all the way to the year 2002. So we are just chugging along. I mean, if you've been following the channel, you know I did many This Year in Perfume videos all the way until the present. Then I went back and at the request of some of you folks, started to rank them. People loved, uh, they love ranked videos. It's just part of watching YouTube fragrance videos. It's one of the most popular fragrance video type. And I don't like doing lists constantly, um, but I do like the fact that I was able to come up with a couple ways to discuss perfume that I think are unique and different than just top 10 fall list, you know, top 10 compliment fragrances. You know, I wanted to do something different. So I came up with the idea of this year in perfume where we can talk about fragrances that were created in the same year. And I and then I went back and, and did these rankings. So we're all the way to 2002. Um, so there's an entire playlist of this. If you like this type of content, you can go watch my playlist and view the other videos in the list. Uh, but today it's going to be a top 10, which actually just worked out perfectly. There's 10 bottles in my collection from 2002. So it's a top 10. So here's one for the YouTube algorithm, if you will. I do have two honorary mentions that are samples that we have discussed on the channel. Or actually, one of them, maybe we have not discussed it on the channel, but we will very soon. Um, and so let's first get ourselves in the right state of mind. Let's go back to the year 2002. I was still in high school. Young Ram was still floating around out there. Um, and so in 2002, some things that happened, some famous news events, let's say, according to um, the people's history.com. So, uh, in the U S U S airways went bankrupt, which I definitely remember flying U S airways as a kid. So it's crazy thinking, um, that they are gone forever. Although technically I think they ended up merging with American airlines. They, they went into bankruptcy. They came out of bankruptcy. They merged with American and American just did away with the name. Um, and the winter Olympics were held. There were some amazing hockey matches in that winter Olympics in 2002 in Salt Lake city. Um, Norway won the most gold medals, Norway, uh, and Germany, the United States and Canada came in second, third, and fourth. The FIFA world cup was held in South Korea. That was an amazing world cup. Germany lost in the final to Brazil that year. And, um, I remember Ronaldo with his little piece of hair only in the front, the rest of it shaved, uh, the Ronaldo, which is now like a, you know, FIFA world cup look, if you will. Um, I remember him scoring a goal and, and when, when uh, Brazil won, that was a fun time of my life. I remember playing FIFA World Cup, the video game on the computer, um, just a very different laid back life. Even, I will say this though, for those of you who have been following my story, you know, uh, even through all of the trials and tribulations, going through the divorce, all the crazy stuff that happens, you know, being in the eye of the storm, if you will, I have been just so calm and so loving every single minute of life lately. It's been such a blessing. You know, I try to appreciate every single moment because every moment is precious. And, um, you know, I know Eugene uh, loves to meditate. And I wouldn't say I'm turning into a meditator, but I am turning into a believer that um, men and women and children should all have time to just look out the window or just kind of sit with themselves and just let their brain wander. You know, that's something that not enough people know how to do nowadays. They're always running around and everything is timed. You've got your calendar. People time everything to the five minute mark. And, you know, sometimes it's like George Carlin once said, let the kid just sit out in the backyard with a damn stick and let him just sit in the grass and play with a stick. Do kids even know what a stick is anymore? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of just one of those things. I've been just not watching as much TV, trying to read and just let my mind go. And it's been, it's been beautiful. Um, but, you know, back then, of course, in high school, you're ignorant of, of what life has to offer uh, or, or what life will throw at you. Everyone has their trials and tribulations, right? So 2002 in high school, I was doing things like playing FIFA video games and stuff like that. Um, the euro becomes the official currency of 12 of the European Union's members. And Kmart filed for bankruptcy, which is crazy. Sorry, I dropped my pen because mm, I remember going to Kmart's when I was a kid. And are they a thing anymore or are they completely done? Um, no Child Left Behind Act signed by George Bush. Speaking of George Carlin, um, he said that, you know, back in the day we used to say we were going to, they, they had what was called the Head Start program. We were going to give kids a head start. Now we have child, children left behind. Um, George Carlin's the man. You should watch his stand-up if you never have. 
Um, and Yasser Arafat died. I guess that's kind of, uh, um, you know, with everything going on in the Middle East. That was, um, oh, I'm sorry. He did not die in 2002. He was trapped in his compound in 2002 and stayed there until his death in 2004. Oh, wow. That's, that's kind of crazy. Um, okay. So let's talk about things that are not as dark. How about some movies? In 2002, things like Scooby-Doo, The Ring, Harry Potter, and the Chamber of Secrets, Spider-Man, Gangs of New York, 28 Days Later, Catch Me If You Can, that's a great movie. I think Leonardo DiCaprio is a great actor. Uh, City of God, Lord of the Rings, The Pianist, Serving Sarah, Unfaithful, Red Dragon, Irreversible, Signs. Is Signs the one that the damn aliens knew how to fly across the damn universe, but they were too stupid to open a door? Is that the M. Shamalama Ding Dong movie that... They were too dumb to open the door, or am I thinking of another one? Um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, 8 Mile, Resident Evil, Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, fantastic stuff. Minority Report, I'm sure there's a ton of good movies from 2002. Um, 007 Die Another Day, I think I saw that one in theaters with my high school girlfriend at the time. Um, So yes, Triple X, was that Vin Diesel? Ice Age? Um, There were some good movies back then. Now Hollywood just sucks, although to be fair... To be fair, I am very much looking forward to seeing the new Napoleon movie. There's very few movies that Hollywood puts out that I could give two squirts about nowadays. But um, that movie right there, Napoleon, looks amazing. I can't, I I actually want to watch that, which is crazy because I never want to watch any of the new movies. And um, songs, uh, How You Remind Me, Nickelback, Foolish by Ashante, Hot in Here by Nelly. Um, in the end, Lincoln Park, that's a good one. You Got It Bad, Usher. Um, what else? What else? Eminem had a hit, uh, Without Me in 2002. Um, so yes, Jennifer Lopez, I'm Gonna Be Alright. I'm sure there were some amazing songs. I'm just looking at the top 100. Um, okay, so that puts us in the 2002 frame of mind. So I know you guys aren't here to talk, uh, movies and songs and news events so let's talk about perfume so first let's do scent of the day because today's scent of the day actually i think this is my favorite from the brand and i'm going to review this maybe even i'll wear this tomorrow just to wear it again and maybe do a full review tomorrow uh, because i have a little 10 mil discovery atomizer this is how they look from the brand this is from the brand sense of wood and this is called oud in bourbon so this is created by pascal garan who also created their biggest hit for the brand, which is this one right here. He created um, Plum and Cognac. But I actually think I like Oud and Bourbon better. Oud and Bourbon, um, the name actually describes it pretty well to some extent, and to some extent it doesn't. Because is there Oud and Bourbon in here? Yes. But to me, I get much more of the coffee, the cacao absolute, which gives it like this chocolatey coffee feel. It's almost like a... Um, hot chocolate slash coffee, but with a floral touch. And you know, coffee blossoms, if you've ever seen coffee blossoms, coffee blossoms have this white flower that grow on them. And there is a white flower smell in here. I think it's a blend of the frangipani and the divana. Um, And it makes it very spicy, but also slightly floral, but it smells like you're smelling floral coffee mixed with that, of course, oud note. And the bourbon is really in the background. All of these brands' offerings, and this is how this basically, here's the notes, if you really want the entire note listing according to the brand. Um, And so this, you can see right here how it says, organic sugar cane alcohol used, aged in a vintage bourbon barrel. So many of these fragrances are aged in this vintage bourbon barrel is the idea, hence the sense of wood, right? And they all come off as having this aged smell. I mean, they all basically come across as having this aged, um, like pulling the wood tannins out of the aged barrel, if that makes sense. But this one, I think this is one of the better from the brand. Um, I definitely like it more than Plum and Cognac, which got all the accolades. But there are others from the brand that are not bad. So Pascal Garin did a good job with that one. Okay, let's do the two honorary mentions. Uh, And then we will jump into the top 10. So first honorary mention, and this is very prescient since just a couple days ago, uh, the brand of Amouage released DF40, if I'm not mistaken. 
the exceptional x-ray, along with the jubilation x-ray, whatever they call it. Um, and this one's called Dia Woman. So this came out in 2002, and it was a um, Jean-Claude Elena creation, which actually, interestingly enough, happens to be the other sample from 2002 as well. He was a busy man in 2002. So um, Dia Woman is a fragrance that if you watched my... Amouage Women live stream, which by the way, I have to say thank you, Allie, for sending me this sample. Otherwise, I never would have been able to smell um, Dia Woman. And so this is a very floral, powdery fragrance. And instantly when I smelled it, yeah, I mean, you smell it, and at least for me, for the kind of stuff that I like to wear, I'm like, wow, this is not for me, okay? It's just not for me. Um, you know, some people say it's like... Uh, Amouage does Chanel number no. five or something like that. This sort of, but I don't, I don't see that as much. There is a soapiness to the fragrance, okay? So if there are aldehydes in here, it comes across as a very soapy aldehydic type smell with um, violet leaf, figs. There's all of these notes and I don't really get very many of them. There's cyclamen, sage, tarragon, peach blossom. I do get the peach blossom. Peony which is also a note used in Dia Man, which is going to make an appearance much, much higher on this list. Iris, Orange Blossom Absolute, Rose, White Musk, Heliotrope, Sandalwood, Cedar, Frankincense, Guyacwood, and Vanilla. And with that note listing, you would think, man, this thing's a bomb. It's not. It's actually one of Jean-Claude Elena's uh, just signature fragrances. He loves making these very ethereal, soft perfumes. And so even though this has this amouage you know, the ingredients in here are fantastic. Everything smells extremely high quality. But it comes across as kind of muted on the skin. It doesn't shout. In fact, if you tested this in a store and you tested it next to everything, this would be just overshadowed by everything else you were smelling. But, but, here's the big but. The big but is that this is... A, a brilliant composition if you're somebody who, like my brother Eugene, has come to love these very soft fragrances that kind of come and go. This is very creamy and soapy, and the florals in here are brilliant. It's not for me, okay? This is not my type of scent. I would not want to be walking around wearing this all day. As beautiful as it is, it's just not my thing. Um, but if you love floral perfumes, I would urge you to check out Dia Woman, and maybe the exceptional X-ray is going to fix some of the problems I was saying with it being very soft, but, you know, for me, that's kind of a pass, but I really do appreciate the, um, I really do appreciate the, um, the quality of that scent. Okay, so the other honorary mention is a Frederick Mall, and it is also a Jean-Claude Elena, and this is called Bigarade Concentré. So I hope I have enough to spray this blotter and then do a review for you guys. It's hard to tell with these mall um, samples, sort of, you know, how much you have left. Uh, I'm just going to, well, I don't want to, I don't, if it's the last spray, I don't want to spray it on here. I'm going to wait. Um, but Bigarad Concentre from memory is basically a um, citrusy fresh fragrance. Bigarad is this bitter orange note, and of course, he used that bitter orange note to perfection in Terre d'Hermes, his most popular fragrance of all time. This is bitter orange, cardamom, cedarwood, hay, and pink pepper, and it gives a little homage back to Eau de Hermes. Of course, he always gives little breadcrumbs to his teacher, uh, Edmund Renitska. Um, I think it's uh, it's this is even more of what... Jean-Claude Elena stands for Bigarad Concentre than Dia Woman. Dia Woman is him sort of taking his style and trying to apply it to an amouage, whereas Bigarad Concentre is really him being himself. Um, so I'm going to review Bigarad Concentre on the channel one of these days, but I do not have a bottle of that and I, and I wouldn't plan on getting one. Okay, so let's get started. Some of these I actually did some pre-spraying on because it's been a while since I've smelled them and I wanted to kind of remind myself. Uh, but number 10 on the list, and real quick before we get started, keep in mind that fragrance tastes change, okay? So if you ask me tomorrow, my my countdown list ranking very well may be different. Um, 
you know, one thing that you'll notice over time, if when, if you're in the fragrance game for a long time and you love smelling a lot of different things, you'll notice that things you loved in the past, you may still love them, but you may not love them as much as you used to love them, if that makes sense. And so tastes just evolve. You know, you get on kicks. Sometimes you love a particular note. Sometimes you love a particular brand or a perfumer or, you know, style of perfume. And you have preferences. And so for me, remember, when I say number one, I'm not saying it's better than number 10. I'm just saying my personal preference on what I prefer to wear right now. So keep that ranking in mind. And this absolutely could change if you ask me tomorrow. But this is just a fun way to talk about a lot of fragrances. So number 10 on the list. Number 10 is a designer. And it's actually, in my opinion, it's a good designer. It's not a designer that's going to blow the doors off. It's not going to you know, it's not going to reset the market. It's not going to, you know, when you smell this, you're not going to just be amazed by how artistic it is, but it's well done. It's a fresh, spicy fragrance by the house of Givenchy, and this is called Givenchy Pour Homme. Now, probably one of my least favorite Givenchy fragrances because they just have some of my all-time favorite. I mean, you think about um, something like this. I mean, think about some of the gems that they've come out with. Givenchy's Gentleman, right? Top 10 fragrance for me of all time. My favorite patchouli of all time. Um, and so you go back to then, you could talk about things like um, Monsieur de Givenchy, which is discontinued. And I love this Haute Concentration version, right? So here's some all-time great fragrances I'm going to review one of these days. Um, and so this just, these type of fragrances for me, this, these newer fragrances, they just fall kind of to the background a lot of times. And I overlook them a lot. I, I want to know what these smell like because I want to be able to talk about them and show them on the channel. But they're not my favorite type of fragrances. And that's why this is at number 10. But objectively, for a designer, I do think this is good. Uh, there's this designer-like freshness to it. And it opens up with some very nice citruses. Grapefruit and mandarin orange. But in the designer style. Um, again, you, this is not a fragrance that you're going to be like, wow, the mandarin orange is just so amazing. What a brilliant, I mean, no, the notes in here wear like a designer. They feel like a designer. There's a little bit of that designer sweetness, if you will, poking around somewhere. Uh, Alberto Morias and Elias Hermendez created this and Elias Hermendez has done some amazing stuff. No one talks about him, but he is very, very interesting. And, um... There's a lavender note in here, which is, um, you know, the lavender note keeps it uh, from smelling too new school designer. You know, there's a little old school lavender in here. There's also vetiver, so two traditionally masculine notes, but it's kind of built around this very modern, those two traditional masculine notes kind of built around this very modern uh, frame, if you will with the citruses and the citruses last because as a, you know, as a designer, um, they want this to remain sort of as fresh and mass appealing as possible. So they made the citruses really last into the dry down. You get the mandarin orange and the grapefruit and coriander uh, into the dry down. And, but the star of the show is the cedar note. There's this woody cedar that's probably mixed with isoe super and some sort of synthetic cedar, but it smells very good. It smells very um, professional, buttoned up, very attractive. And there's a little bit of labdanum just to add some, you know, sometimes patchouli can be used to add like this, you know, just like a little bit of just, you know, like you put an anchor on something and you, it weighs it down, right? That's what the labdanum does here. You're not going to be able to pick out this high class labdanum note, you know, it's it's not a labdanum heavy fragrance. It's a cedar heavy fragrance. Um, it's a woody heavy fragrance. And so it's like woods with old school lavender and vetiver, but done in a very designer, modern way, if you will. And so for me, um, here, here's what the brand says. They say, the, the Givenchy gentleman is elegant, creative with an intuitive sense of style. Yes. He chooses perfume for his own day-to-day -day enjoyment, no matter what the occasion is. Givenchy Pour Homme is, above all, a gentleman. Fresh and woody, it contains the refinement of divana and masculinity of cedar and olibanum. So, I don't get very much olibanum, I will tell you that. Maybe you could, if you really sort of stretched your brain a little bit, 
You could see maybe a little smoky cedar, but I definitely don't get olibanum. Not in the sense that you're going to get it like from an amouage. Mm -mm. Uh, much more just cedar, lavender, vetiver. Um, and it just comes across with that designer sweetness. So hence the number 10 spot on the list. Number nine. Number nine on the list is a discontinued fragrance that some people try to make out to be much better than it is, okay? They try to make it out to be this unicorn. They try to sell it for hundreds of dollars. It's not worth that. I will tell you that right now. It's not worth it. Um, however, if you can find a bottle like I did for 30 bucks or so, it's worth it, all right? And this is the discontinued Escada. Escada doesn't make men's fragrances at all. They're all discontinued now. This is Escada Sentiment. So the bottle's kind of cool. It's like a Lego piece or something, you know. Um, and so Escada Sentiment is a creation by um, another very well-known perfumer. So this is Dominique Ropion and Laurent Bruyere. Sorry, I just butchered that name. Bru Bruyere? Must be Bruyere. That sounds a lot better than Bruyere. Um, so this opens up very zesty, very energetic, lots of, like, I just imagine, like, um, you know, I just imagine, like, an atom, and it's just bouncing around, right? Um, so, there's lime, and there's juniper berry, but you also get a lot of the pepper right from the beginning, and it's pink pepper and pimento, so you get this peppery pimento sort of, um, you know, the juniper adds this sprightliness. Imagine like being handed a drink of gin and tonic and the lady just poured you the tonic water and it's like still fizzing and bubbling, right? That's what the juniper on the top smells like. And the base is cedar, sandalwood, and vetiver. So it's actually in a very similar category. These two, and what's interesting is if you take a look at the colors used, even the colors used are very similar. I'm very curious to see if they were, if I, I'm very... I'm always interested when fragrances come out and at a similar time, whether they're kind of watching, they're like keeping an eye on each other from across, you know, like opening the blinds, like what are you guys doing over there kind of thing. Um, because these play in the same sandbox for sure. I, um, I prefer sentiment because I think it's a little bit more interesting, but it's not interesting to the point where you should go pay two or three hundred dollars for that. Absolutely not. You would get completely ripped off. There is maybe a little bit of something um, slightly fruity in here. Just slightly. Maybe some black currant or, you know, something along those lines. Black currant, blackberry. I'm sure there's no blackberry, but maybe black currant. Um, and it it feels designer as well that's the thing and of course Escada was a designer house but the first two wear very designer um this is probably my least favorite Escada let's put it that way I would much rather wear Escada Porom from 1993 or Magnetism for Men or even Casual Friday Ca um Sentiment Porom gets pushed to the back for me it's one of the weaker Escadas which is interesting because Dominique Ropion is such an amazing perfumer but um, this one just, I mean, for a hot day, I think this shines in, in the heat a little bit because there is that freshness again. So there's that designer lime in the opening. Givenchy's Porom uses, um, they ended up using mandarin orange and grapefruit and Sentiment Porom uses lime, but they're both trying to sort of do the same thing. The citruses try and really hang around and they try and be this very, mass appealing feel okay so if you're a guy that likes to wear stuff that's just you know you don't like to wear anything that's weird or too artistic you want to wear something designer mass appealing those are two good ones to to those are good starter fragrances okay number eight number eight on the list is a trumper fragrance a gof trumper and this is called sandalwood cologne so sandalwood cologne um came out in 2002, obviously, it wouldn't be on the list if it did if it didn't come out in 2002. Um, and sandalwood cologne ended up coming ended up smelling very similar to a fragrance that came out a decade before this. Actually, even more than a decade before this, if you count Bois Noir, uh, which came out in the 80s, uh, and that is Chanel's Egoist. 
So if you've ever smelled Ego East, um, and then you go smell something like sandalwood cologne at number seven, sorry, number eight, we're at number eight. Um, if you go smell sandalwood cologne at number eight, you're going to realize just how very close the two are. I mean, very, very close. There are some note listings that don't necessarily, um, mesh between the two. So I think, um, Ego East has a note of rosewood. There's no rosewood listed here. Um, and, you know, if you do a side-by-side, -side, I think that Ego East smells just much higher quality and higher class to me. Uh, this has lavender, lemon, bergamot, clary sage, carnation, geranium, jasmine, rose, tonka, with sandalwood, patchouli, vanilla, and amber, okay? But it just ends up smelling like... Ego East is the thing. And so when you read, like if you have, if you look at the back of the Trumper uh, box, it says sandalwood is a very rare and precious perfume in, uh, ingredient. And its popularity has caused many substitutes and inferior preparations to be produced. Because don't worry, our sandalwood is of the highest quality. Uh, to uphold our tradition of excellence, the sandalwood oil used by Trumpers in the manufacture of our products is the only the very highest quality and originates from the mountainous Mysore areas of India. Which, holy shit. Um, well, they're saying it originates there. They're not saying it is Mysore sandalwood. So, they're, 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 they got their lawyer to overlook that one for sure. Their lawyer put the monocle on and went, hmm, hmm, yeah, well, if we word it this way, San, Santalum, Al, Santalum Album. The sandalwood tree is a marvel in, in itself, related to the European mistletoe. It is a parasite tree growing to a height of 40 feet and thriving best in the mountainous region of Mysore. The history of sandalwood is as old as civilization itself. In Egypt, it was well known as long ago as 1700 BC and has been held in high esteem ever since. On and on and on and on. Um... Oh, they're even talking about the heartwood of the tree. They don't even, nowadays when they make these sandalwoods, they don't even use the heartwood alone anymore. They use the other woods as well. They used to only use the heartwood um, 25, 30 years ago. I think those days have passed. Ever since the days of the empire and the long association with India, Trumpers have been producing fine sandalwood perfumes and preparations for gentlemen. Wow. That is quite the blurb, Trumper. Um... This came out in 2002, and it is very good, to be fair. I mean, it is very, very good. If you like Ego East, you will like this. Um, but honestly, my problem is just wear Ego East is, is really the thing. So, yes, uh, maybe one day I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison video. I did a comparison video yesterday on um, our good friend Roja Dove. Fetiche, we did Fetiche Pour Homme Parfum versus Fetiche, uh, the paper label, the uh, Eau de Parfum. Uh, and so that's a that's a really good fragrance. Apparently, according to Parfumo, it's discontinued. I don't know. Roja's website says there'll be more stock coming next month, but I don't know. Um, so number seven on the list. So Trumper Sandalwood was number eight. Number seven is a Creed. And to be 100% honest with you guys, if I still had the older bottle, the 120 mil, this would be higher on the list. This would actually be probably two or maybe even three spots higher because from my memory, that older bottle was so much higher quality than this one. This has been reformulated to my nose. It smells completely different. Not completely different, but it smells different enough where, um, especially in the opening, the opening of this, the fragrance itself is not a shadow of its former self. The opening is a shadow of its former self. The opening was like walking into church and smelling the, um, you know, in the Catholic church, they have the holy water. Ever smelled the holy water with the incense kind of going on in the background and just that woodiness, um, the pepperiness. There's a gunpowder accord. And I think that gunpowder accord reminded me of um, 
the holy water in church for some reason. I have no clue why. No clue why, but I cannot get the association out of my head. And, you know, occasionally I'll go to a Catholic church, like on Christmas or something like that, right? And every time I smell the holy water, it smells like this fragrance to me. The vintage, even more so. And it was so much deeper. And the sandalwood note in the vintage version of this was so much deeper. This is Himalaya. So this is the new 100 mil. This is a 2017 batch. This is not a brand new bottle. Um, this is a 2017 batch. And even this one, as soon as I smelled this, um, I went, I'll never buy a new Creed again, ever. This was like my boycott moment. I was like, nope, that's it. I'm going to stick with what I have. No more. No mas. Um, this is bergamot, lemon, mandarin, orange, juniper berry, pepper, jasmine, lavender, nutmeg, and gunpowder accord with cedarwood, sandalwood, tonka bean, and vetiver. And many people say that this takes its um, inspiration from Paco Rabanne's XS, which I have and I love. And um, while XS is a very good perfume, even in its vintage form, I think Himalaya is a better fragrance. Rumor is this was Michael Jordan's signature scent for the longest time. This came out in 2002, so I don't know why I keep saying that. Of course it came out in 2002. It wouldn't be on the video otherwise. But... Um, I guess since 2002, it's been Michael Jordan's signature scent. That is the rumor mill out there. And, um, you know, it's uh, Pierre Bourdon um, is most is credited with creating this. He played with a couple gunpowder accords with other fragrance houses as well, or he tried to. Rumor is before the big boss at Dior ended up getting kicked out, whose name escaped, it always escapes me. But, um, you know, Pierre Bourdon did a Dior fragrance. Uh, and it was like his lifelong dream because his father worked for Dior and all this backstory. You can read about it in the Ghost Perfumer book. But um, apparently he got an approval to create a fragrance using this gunpowder accord, which he thought would be cool. He would be It would be like something unique and different. And before they could put the fragrance out for Dior, the guy who agreed to, to the big boss at Dior ended up stepping down, retiring. Someone else took over. They scrapped the project. So, of course, bam. There it goes, straight to a Creed bottle. Um, and so Olivier Creed gets his Himalaya. Um, and, you know, whenever they, um, uh, you know, whenever they advertise Himalaya, it's funny because they, they advertise it. This is almost supposed to be like silver for like a flask, right? For like a flask, if you're like climbing the Himalayan mountains, imagine like, you know, cool, crisp Himalayan water. Uh, Olivier um, Creed climbed to the top of the Himalayas just to get the special water to distill this beautiful fragrance, right? That, that, that's the kind of marketing you'll find. Um, but in reality, it I, I much more see the association with that gunpowder-like accord that Pierre Bourdon was sort of working on back in the day. And uh, there is something metallic about it, but one of my favorite parts about this fragrance is the sandalwood dry down. It really speaks to the Creed DNA. And it just was done better in the older bottles. It just was, to my nose. There's just there's just no question about it. Um, this is still a good fragrance. It's just not what it was. And that's why it's coming in at number seven. Number six is a fragrance that I think is underrated. And in fact, I'm going to make an insane claim. I know this is my list, but I think I even I underrated it at number six. I think it should have been higher, but there's just some big hitter fragrances that we're coming up on. But this deserves more love. Um, this is Baldessarini. Baldessarini. Um, so, well, right now it's called Baldessarini. Baldessarini. It was originally called Baldessarini by Hugo Boss. So the story basically goes that Baldessarini um, was a Hugo Boss executive. He was like the big boss of Hugo Boss. The big boss of Hugo Boss. And um, his name was Werner Baldessarini. Okay? He was an executive. And um, he devoted himself in his life to the brand of Hugo Boss. And so when he retired, they were so almost like moved and impressed with him that they created a brand of Hugo, that was supposed to be owned by Hugo Boss called Baldessarini. Well, what ended up happening is they ended up um, launching it in Europe a year after it came out in 2002 and spinning it off and creating its own brand, if you will. Um, 
And so the fragrances actually had great success. They uh, won uh, two Fifi Awards. I don't know exactly which ones did. I think this might have been one of them. Uh, this is the original Eau de Cologne, which you can still buy. However, however, and you knew this was coming, it is reformulated. Um, so this is actually now no longer marketed by... Um, this is no longer marketed by... Uh, PNG Prestige, as you can see right there on the bottom. This is now marketed by um, Mauer and Wurtz. Okay, Mauer and Wurtz is now the marketer. And from what I hear, it's been reformulated. I've never smelled it, never smelled the new one, but from what I hear, if you can get these older bottles that actually say Hugo Boss, that's the one that you want if possible. So this is Balde Serini. I've got it sprayed here already. This is a fantastic fragrance um, because it opens up with this freshness that you can see was very popular in the time from things like Givenchy Pour Homme and Sentiment. You can see that this very fresh sort of, um, this is mandarin orange, bitter orange, and spearmint, okay? So you can see this sort of fresh invigorating opening was a thing. But what, in, but what ends up happening here is it starts to bring in notes that you and I would love as fragrance lovers. So it brings in a clove note. You get that eugenol smell. It brings in cumin, and you get a little bit of that dirty cumin. It brings in patchouli, and the fragrance turns heavier. So it starts off very zesty, and and you know almost like you're like, okay, this is gonna be like a citrus fresh fragrance. It's not. It it morphs. It transforms, and it becomes much more balsamic, musky, and the sandalwood note in this is just as good as that Creed sandalwood note I was saying. It is a fantastic fragrance that is completely underrated. It was done by two master perfumers, uh, Pierre Wargnay and Jean-Marc Chailin. Well, Jean-Marc Chailin, I think, is the son of Raymond Chailin. Uh, Raymond Chailin is the true master perfumer. But Pierre Wargnay is the perfumer of this. And what's so interesting about that is Pierre Wargnay made so many amazing Hugo Boss fragrances. So, for example... He made Hugo Boss number one. My, my all-time favorite Hugo Boss fragrance from 1985. Um, he made Paco Rabanne Tenere. He made Dracar Noir. He made La Nuit de Lome by YSL. He made YSL's Lome, which I'm not the biggest fan of. but um, And he did Antidote by Victor and Rolf, Rolf which I absolutely love. So he's, he's a big-time hitter. Um, he did Van Gill's Pour Homme, which is on my list, but I want to fi find a vintage. Um, so Pierre Wargnay, to me, is like, royalty perfume royalty and the fact that this one just for whatever reason i think because it's seen as cheap because you can buy bottles you used to be able to buy them for cheap at discounters and stuff like that um and if you just spray it on the paper and move on you'll think okay it's like a citrusy fresh you know spearminty thing but give it time and it just develops into something amazing huge fan of balde serini and i i need to review this one of these days all right so that was number Six, number five. Number five is Tom Ford literally dragging Yves Saint Laurent into the modern era, kicking and screaming, even though he doesn't want to. Um, and this is a vintage bottle of M7. So actually, let me show you what the new bottles look like too. So the new ones look like this. So this is what the new bottles of M7 look like. And this is actually still a really good fragrance. And this is what the vintage smells like, looks like. Um, and so you can see in the vintage, it just says bergamot, agarwood, vetiver, and amber. In the new version, uh, you can see they've added a couple notes here. They've added patchouli, cystus, and myrrh, okay? So M7, I'm going to spray the new one just because I don't want to waste the vintage juice on, um, on a piece of paper, but, um, I do, re I really like this fragrance, excuse me. And I know there's some people that are like, oh, this is a shit fragrance. It's, you know, it's just, it, it, um, the oud, it, you know, it's nowhere near one of the best ouds. And that's true. It's obviously, once you start smelling things like Ensar and Bortnikoff and Ariz Ladori, it's hard to go back to stuff like this. But out of just pure appreciation of the, of the you know composition itself obviously the oud in here is a designer oud it's not an animalic oud um 
but you can smell, you can smell the designer oud accord in here. And so many people consider this to be the very first oud fragrance uh, in the West, which there is a video done by, gosh, I forget his name, um, Mr. Edwards. And he claims that um, Balenciaga Porom from 1990 had an oud accord, but I don't know. I mean, if he says it, he must have a source, but... This is widely considered the, the first one, I guess, that the West really took to, if you will. That it was advertised as having oud. And um, so this is discontinued, the version from 2002. They now have this version, which I believe you can still buy. I, I don't think they advertise it. It's called M7 Oud Absolu now. So I don't think they advertise it. I think you might have to specifically ask for it. Um, but what I love about this one is it opens up with a little bit more of that cola-like accord. And I love that cola-like vibe that you get from this and things like Creation E by Roja and stuff like that. I love the Coca-Cola smell. Um, and, and this one takes away from that. You don't get the Coca-Cola smell as much. It literally just goes into this resinous mandarin orange smell. So imagine like a, imagine smelling... Oud in the background, which makes it slightly resinous, and they've used myrrh. And myrrh can have a little bit of a fungal slash licorice-like smell. And it's very balsamic and warm. Myrrh adds this unbelievable warmth, right? So imagine smelling this mandarin orange, this resinous mandarin orange is kind of what it smells like in this version. It really smells like the color of the juice. Um, and it's a great starter oud, if you will. This is just very expensive. These vintage bottles are, are very hard to find, if you can even find them. Um, but the, the, the new version that they make is, is quite acceptable. I wouldn't go pay huge money for a vintage unless you're just a collector. Um, all right, so that was number five. Number four. Number four is one of the greatest vetivers uh, in the modern era, let's say. And this is from the house of Frederick Mall, and this is called Vetiver Extraordinaire by Dominique Ropion. Again, we're seeing the same perfumers over and over again. This is a pre-Estee Lauder bottle. This is back when Frederick Mall was Frederick Mall. Um, and he would argue, hey, I'm still Frederick Mall, but you know, you're you're influenced by Estee Lauder now. Um, but I would love to smell and get to know the new heaven can wait. That's that's really high on my to sniff list. So, Vetiver Extraordinaire is Dominique Gropion doing a very earthy and um, uh, spicy vetiver. So, think about, you know, getting a lot of pepper in the top. They list pink pepper, but I get a lot of black pepper in the top of this when I smell. So, think of like a pe peppery vetiver with cashmeran. And cashmeran um, is a synthetic ingredient that some people love and some people absolutely hate cashmeran um, but it adds a little bit of a fuzziness to the to the composition it's supposed to add a slightly floral slightly woody slightly spicy slightly musky it kind of is like a jack of all trades if you will but it it literally adds this fuzzy feels the way i describe it like cashmere i mean imagine feeling cashmere but when you smell it it's supposed to be this um iff ingredient that is soft and spicy and woody and floral and it does all these different things um and but dominique ropion blended it beautifully with the haitian vetiver the woods the oak moss and the musk and this is a very good fragrance and i think um Guerlain kind of copied this whenever they created their vetiver extreme which came out in 2007 of course Guerlain's vetiver from the late 50s by the great jean paul Guerlain is the all-time great vetiver but this is up there. I mean, for me, this is this is this is up there as one of the better vetivers. So vetiver extraordinaire at number uh, four. Number three. Number three. So we have one of the best vetivers of modern time. How about one of the best incenses of modern time? This is Comme des Garcons Incense Avignon. Um, incense Avignon is actually. I want to spray this. Um, it has been a while since I've smelled this bad boy. Let us, let us spray incense Avignon. Um, oh yeah, baby. 
I mean, <laughs> so the first thing you're going to notice when you smell this, if you're a lover of incense, the first thing you're going to notice is just how lemony and almost creamy the incense smells. Yes, you get that church incense. Yes, absolutely. Like incense going up onto, you know, a 10 story church and you can just see it wafting to the ceiling. But there is this unbelievable lemony, um, silky, smooth, creamy aspect to the incense. Really something to marvel at. And it's because he used both LME, which is a lemony incense, which it's, it smells like a lemony, fresher incense, and frankincense together. And he mixed it with patchouli, Roman chamomile, which I think is what adds that creamy feel to the fragrance, and cystus labdanum, okay? And so the labdanum, of course, adds that sticky you know, resinous side of things. The the frankincense and LME add the smoky th side of things. And um, the vanilla adds just a little bit of sweetness. But it's very... Bertrand Duchafort is the master of incense. And here, he really created what, in my opinion, is one of the all-time great incense. Like, if you just want an example of a proper incense, right? There's this. There's Andy Towers' Incense Extreme which I actually think I prefer Incense Extreme in the vintage bottle. I don't know what the new one smells like, but my vintage bottle is fantastic. Um, and then there's um, Armani's Bois d'Encens. Those three, to me, are like, you want pure incense? Those three are competing for the top spot. And Healy's Cardinal, I guess I should say. Now, I know there's some other folks who would come in and say, you have to smell Lavs by Unum. I've never smelled that one. Um... But I think that's more of a true composition. I mean, this is just like you're smelling like it's a great example of an incense solar floor almost. There's other things going on, but it just it just um, helps raise the incense, if you will. Yeah, I mean, just a perfect, perfect example. Uh, and that's why it's coming in at number three. And so for me, honestly, these last two, it's like, uh, what's, what's the better, what's in your mind, Ramsey, which note do you prefer right now? And I picked incense at number three, but honestly, if I was on a vetiver kick, this would probably be number three and this would be number four. They are, they are that close to me. Um, now number two and number one, um, number one was a no brainer. I knew it from the very beginning. I didn't even, I didn't even flinch at number one. Um, and it is a Bertrand du Chafour, but number two you know, I had a tough time. I almost put this somewhere else and then I moved it around. I kind of thought about it more. Um, but honestly, the, the more I've worn this, the more I have absolutely come to fall in love with it and this brand, the brand in general. So this is a vintage bottle. The bottle does not look like this anymore. So at number two, we have Santa Maria Novella's Nostalgia from 2002. And so if you're wondering what this is... Uh, this is a man's hands gripping a vintage steering wheel, like a classic car steering wheel is what that is. And what's cool about these old bottles, well, the cap is obviously cool. Um, although it's very, very light, I like the cap and I like the little detailing. Um, there was, a, I think, a sticker or something on there. And um, check this out. So this is like individually numbered. Look at that. How cool is that? Bottle number 220. Um, very, very cool. I, I, I'm really digging this brand. So again, it doesn't look like this anymore. Now it's bottled in the same bottle that they pretty much bottle all of their bottles in, which look like this. Thank you, Dushan, for sending me this um, Pot d'Espagne, by the way, brother. Um, hope you are doing well wherever you are, my friend. And so, um, Dushan sent me an entire bottle of Pot d'Espagne and it leaked on the way here. And this is, this is basically what was left, but that's still more than enough juice for me to appreciate it and love it. And look at the detailing on their new bottles. Engraving, they used to do stickers. Um, now it's, uh, engraved on there. And look at that beautiful Santa Maria Novella logo on the back of the new bottle. So I like this bottle as well, but this is just something a little special, a little different. Because they don't do these little unique bottles anymore. 
So um, I think the juice from what I hear is, is almost identical. But what makes this fragrance so crazy, nostalgia, um, and I'm going to review this one of these days. I don't think I have a review of this on the channel. But um, this is opening up almost like you are sitting in your garage. And if you've ever sort of um, been in a garage that has like this epoxy floor, right? One of those floors that they put down where, you know, it's shiny, it's glistening, um, dirt, leaves, spider webs don't stick to it. You can just take your uh, blower and just, and it just goes right off and it's completely smooth. And it's like, it's like putting Scotch guard on your garage floor, right? There's this almost fuel like smell, but it's not like Fahrenheit. It opens up different from Fahrenheit, but think of, um, think of a unique take on Fahrenheit with more Styrax and, um, it, it, as it dries down, more and more of the vanilla come out from memory and the tobacco. And it's just a, I think it's an amazing journey. Now, if the opening lasted longer, this could easily have been number one. It is that good. Uh, but it really turns into a softer, vanillic, musky, ambery, tobacco-y dry down. Um, but that opening is insane. It's one of the craziest openings in perfumery, but it literally lasts minutes. So you have to pay attention and it changes. Um, but leathery, spicy, you know, if you like spicy, leathery scents, I just showed you two absolute bangers from Santa Maria Novella, but this is much, much older. This is like 1901. Um, and so the brand really deserves more, more hype and more talk, I believe. But Nostalgia is a fantastic perfume at number two. And number one, um, number one, I mean, no brainer. It was in the thumbnail. You knew, it, you knew what it was. Um, I don't think I can hide my love for this brand of Emouage. This is Dia Man. And so this is the um, vintage, uh, you know, friction cap. And this is the more modern uh, magnetic cap. But... This is still an old bottle. I think this is like a 2015 batch or something. I'm not sure. You know, they used to do the batches like this on the bottom. That's how you know it's an older bottle. So this is not a new... Both of these smell fantastic. I, I would have no problem wearing either. Um, and I was going to do a comparison video, but they both smell so similar. I think I'm just going to review the damn thing one of these days. But Dia Man is, for me, one of Bertrand Duchefort's masterpieces. Everyone talks about Jubilation 25, and rightly so. Everyone talks about Timbuktu. Everyone talks about Sheeper Palatine. Everyone talks about Incense Avignon. Everyone talks about these other, you know, you could say big hits that he has had. I really like Zonka. Um, I've got, hopefully, fingers crossed, if I can ever get a package from Rich Mitch, I've got Traverse du Bosphor coming over. Um, you know, he's done Seville Alaub, which I was, eh, I'm not 100% taken with that one yet. He's done Sartorial. Um, or, or du Sorel. Uh, he's done some amazing fragrances. This one in particular, though, I think this this really highlights sort of the way that he, when he was in his at his prime, uh, one of the most sought after perfumers of all time. And um, what he did with Dia Man, I think, was just absolutely brilliant. So first of all, this fragrance is a soft fragrance. It wears very close to the skin, very similar to the way I was describing Dia Woman, okay? Doesn't project a lot. It lasts a long time, but it's not going to shout, okay? It sits close to you. Someone has to really enter your bubble, okay? And what's interesting is they use the note of peony, and peony is a very um, quiet flower. Like, you could be right next to peony and not smell it. You have to stick your nose dead in it, right? But it's one of the most beautiful narcotic smells you'll ever smell. And he's blended this cardamom, frankincense, labdanum, and bitter orange, which Jean-Claude uh, Elena may have rubbed off a little bit on him while he was making Dia Woman using the bitter orange. Bertrand du Chafour used a little bit of bitter orange in Dia Man. And it's blended with this superb note of iris, just fantastic. Uh, iris and plum blossom, okay? And it dries down to this woody, uh, leathery, ambery. It's just, I think it's a masterpiece. It's going to get an Amouage Hall of Fame review from me one of these days. And as far as wearing something classy for the office that sets you apart, I don't think you can do better on a 
office fragrance than Dia. Dia is one of the greatest office fragrances of all time. Dia Man, um, because it's unique, masculine, um, and yet there's something very suave, very uh, dapper, very professional, but sets you apart from everyone else. So um, that's my top 10 on the year 2002. Let me know what your favorites are. If I've missed any from 2002 that you love, leave it in the comments. Um, you know, I love seeing your faces. I love the interaction. Try to keep these videos under an hour, but a lot of it is just about me rambling and talking about a lot of different things. So appreciate everyone watching, commenting, all the stuff that you guys do to, you know, show your support. I very, very much appreciate it. So thanks for watching, everyone. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.